So welcome. Uh, this is really if if this is really a configuration system basics. So we're going to touch on maybe we'll touch on, on some intermediate stuff. But I'm a big believer that if you're going to use Drupal 8's configuration system, you really kind of have to understand uh, right here in the front row, yeah. right here, right in front of me. There you go. <laughs> um, you really have to understand what's going on behind the scenes, I think. And actually, what's going on behind the scenes is it's not that hard to understand. So um, first of all, this is me. I'm a Drupal trainer, consultant, about 50-50, split time-wise for me. Um, been in the community for uh, over 12 years. Um, I'm Ultimike pretty much everywhere. Um, probably the thing I'm known most for is uh, I, I run a 12-week online Drupal training program. So three half days a week, all online. I have some graduates at this camp. I actually have one of my students at this camp as well. Um, been doing it for like six or seven years. So if you're interested in something like that, let me know. We also do some online. I do an online DDEV class. I did a DDEV training here on uh, Thursday. So there's that. So what are we, what's, what's the goal here? Uh, understand the basics. Um, yeah. And comfort, not with all of them. This, I actually use this slideshow for a full day course on the configuration system as well. Um, you're just going to kind of get the ultimate highlights. But really, this is, uh, you know, there's two or three slides here that if you remember nothing else <laughs> from the next 45 minutes, um, remember this slide and one or two others. And really, if you're going to use the configuration system, it's probably 25% technical, 75% process. So you and your team need to have a process in place to manage configuration on your site. Drupal 8's configuration system is a great tool. It helps you as part of that process. Um, but I've seen it happen, you know, more than one occasion that if you have a five developer team and three people are using the configuration system and two people aren't, you might as well not even be using it. You really, it has to be a team effort. Everybody has to understand the process. All right. Oh, so I talk ahead of my slides all the time. So now we're going to review, apparently. Um, and yeah, so the, the second point is it's all or nothing. Um, and that has to do both on the process side. I just mentioned if everybody on your team isn't using it, you're probably going to have a hard time. But the other thing about the configuration system, which um, how many people have used features in Drupal 7? How many people have used the configuration system in Drupal 8? Anybody? OK, so a few. Um, the big difference between, for those of you that have used features in Drupal 7, is configuration Drupal 8 is all. You don't pick and choose the things you want to, you know, export. You're basically hitting a button or preferably running a Drush command that exports all the configuration of your site. Um, and when you import, you're importing all the configuration to your site. So it's a little bit of a different mindset than features where you design a feature for like a slideshow feature. Or, you know, I used to give a feature uh, talk, not completely similar to this, but you talk about like how, how do we design features in Drupal 7. Sometimes they're vertical like slideshow or news articles, or sometimes they're horizontal like we have all your content types in a feature or all your views in a feature. This is one giant bucket of all of your config in there. So it's a little bit simpler, um, but there's pros and cons with it. OK, so hopefully um, you all know this, right? Uh, Drupal database generally has two types of data. Anybody want to shout out what those two types of data are? I'll give you one of them, content and configuration, right? And uh, one is obviously dependent on the other. <clears throat> Um, and ideally, in a, in a, if you have a good, solid developer workflow, you're developing locally. And you're making code changes locally. You're not remotely developing on a dev server somewhere. Hopefully, you're doing it locally. And ideally, if you're building a new content type, you're doing that locally as well. And you're making sure that all, all works locally. And then you're pushing that up through your dev environment, your test environment, your production environment. Um, through dev, test, QA, production. Um, but if configuration's in the database, that, you know, that, that's the rub, right? That's the problem. Because if you have a good, solid, basic workflow, and this is 
kind of a simplified version. There's no continuous integration stuff here. Um, generally, the idea is that you work locally and code flows up, right? You're only ever pushing into your repository from local. And then you pull in those changes into your development um, environments or your test environments or your production environments. And so work happens here, right? And, you know, these are just for review and testing and, and ultimately your live site. Um, and on the other side, your content is generally always ever flowing down. That's, you know, for the sake of this discussion, we'll just talk about the database, but you can also talk about your files directory, but we'll talk about the database for now. You know, if you spend five hours building three content types and two views and a text format and you're adding 37 fields down here um, and it's all working great, how do you get all that stuff up here? You know, this is, you know, when you add a new content type and you hit that save button, those changes go into the database. So, you know, are you going to copy your local database and plop it in production and look, my new content type, sorry about your, you know, six months worth of content, but it's not really a, a reasonable solution. So code flows up, content flows down. The problem is our configuration is stored in the database. So the configuration system, much like features, when you export configuration, it takes a copy of that configuration from the database, sticks it in the file system, which allows you to commit it to code. Boom, now you're on the right path over here. So the whole idea behind the configuration system is getting that configuration out of the database in a way that's portable via Git to move up your chain of environments. Um, yeah, so obviously if we copy the database up to live, that would be bad. Um, nor is it really practical to move a subset of database tables. You, you, I mean, theoretically it's possible, right? But you really have to know what you're doing, and it's fraught with errors. I mean, it's fraught with problems, I should say, because there's so many dependencies in a Drupal database. Your content depends on configuration. Um, when you add a field to an entity in Drupal, you know, minimum you're creating two new tables in your database. So you really have to be careful uh, if you're even going to attempt this. I don't even, this is really isn't, shouldn't be on your radar or something to do. Um, so the Drupal 8 configuration system provides that tool, that command, that mechanism to take that configuration out of the database, put it into YAML files. Great, git, git add, commit, push, git pull, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then on the other half, other side of things, I think my next slide, do, 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 yes. Well, let me back up and let, I'll talk about it on this slide. Um, so the idea is you're on your local, you create a new content type, tap, 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 click, 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 hit save, that stuff goes into your database. By the way, this is the other slide, if you're gonna remember something, this is the slide. Um, so your configuration's in here on your local. And ultimately, you want to get that up to dev. Um, so you run a, you know, a drush command to export your configuration. And what does that do? That takes a co it copies your config from here, and it writes it out to a bunch of configuration files on your file system. Um, and we're going to see this. We're gonna, you know, I'm going to show you the config in the database. We're going to run the command. I'm going to show you the config in files. And this is a pretty simple command. What it's actually doing behind the scenes, we're going to see it, and it's really simple. Um, then you get these config files, and what do you do? You do your git add and commit. It's in your local. You do your git push. It's in your remote repository. And then you pull those files into, let's say, your dev environment. So at this point, once you pull those files into your dev environment, they're just files. That's just a copy of your configuration. You know, when your site is running, it's pulling configuration, your active configuration out of the database. So we need kind of the mirror image of the export command is we need an import command to take all of your config for your site and bring it in to the database. Now, where this is a pretty simple exercise, this export. Import, this can get pretty complex because, you know, enabling a module is configuration. So when you enable a module, that module has install hooks. That module can be creating tables, it can be modifying fields, it can be adding records. So if you have a configuration that enables a module, during that import, that import has to be smart enough to say, okay, well, 
you know, a module is being enabled, so now I have to do all the things that that module needs. Now I have to create tables and, and, and whatever else has to be done. So this is kind of the, the simple export, and this is a much more complex process. But the end result is all of this configuration is now your active configuration in the database. So what's important to remember here, and this is the part where the configuration system, you really have to have a good process, is when you run this import command, whatever configuration is active basically gets flushed and replaced with what's in here. So this leads to the very common problem when you're new to the configuration system is, I added a content type up here, or someone else added a content type up here. Um, meanwhile, the developer doing things the right way does everything down here, goes through our process. And the one mistake that our good developer does is they don't check to see that there's outstanding configuration up here, configuration that hasn't been exported. And they do an import, and that new content type gets flushed and gets replaced with everything in here, and then suddenly you're down a content type. That's where process comes in. And there's actually some Drupal modules that can help, help with that process and kind of you know, enforce the process. Um, but in the big picture, this is the configuration system. And there's, you know, there's, we'll likely have time to mention a couple modules that might modify this a little bit in places. But when I title this you know, Drupal 8 Configuration System Basics, this is the basics right here. Any questions yet? Should I grab some water? <laughs> Everybody good? Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Yes. No. Uh, that, we could talk about that a little bit, but ideally, if you're going to have a conflict with configuration, it should happen on your local in Git. It should be a Git conflict. Because remember, there's not going to be a conflict on import because whatever configuration is in here, flushed, gone. So there's no mechanism, there's nothing to conflict because the first thing an import does is get rid of all this. So I guess that's good. <laughs> You're never going to have a conflict <laughs> there. <laughs> You're going to have other places. But, but that, you know, we're talking about, this is the 25%, right? This is the mechanism. This is the tool. You know, the 75%, the process, that's where you want to avoid the conflicts. That's where you want to have processes so you don't have those conflicts. Or if you do have those conflicts, or if you do have, you know, the situation where someone, you know, is, is changing config up here, you have a process in place to capture that config and get it into your repo so that when this person tries to push their new config, they're going to get, you know, a get push rejected because there's outstanding changes. They're going to have to pull those changes down. And then if there's a conflict, it's going to happen in Git in the YAML files. All right? Okay. All right. So um, this is super important, this part as well. Um, and this is the part I think that you, I know for me, when I started using the configuration system, um, I was solid on the basics, but this took me a little while to really appreciate how important this bit is, is these two commands, this config import and config export, it needs to go hand in hand with git pull, git push, git checkout. So follow me on this. So we're used to doing git pulls, right? We get to work in the morning, we open up our computer, and we see a task in our project tracker, and we say, okay, well, let's fire up our local environment. What's the first thing we normally do is we pull, right? We want to make sure we have the latest code. Well, if you're using a configuration system, when you do that git pull, that could always include, possibly include new configuration from another developer, right? So whenever we do a git pull, we also need to consider doing a config import because that pull from the remote repository could be bringing in new configuration. So these two commands kind of have to start going hand in hand. You don't always have to do a drush config import. At the very least, you have to, you know, if you're getting commits down when you do your pull, you need to take a quick look at them and see if any of those commits include configuration. If they do, import them. 
you know, we're, uh, when we think that we're done with the task at our local, we're used to doing git add, git commit, git push. But if you're working locally and that change has to do with maybe a tweak to a custom module and maybe a little bit of a configuration change somewhere as well, when you do that, you have to make sure you get that configuration into the code base along with whatever your code changes are. So when you do a git add, you know, consider if you change any configuration, you, you got to do this git config export first and get that configuration change into that commit. So our, you know, our friends, our git add, commit push, and our git pull, these buddies of ours that have served us well over the last few years, they're going to get like new sidekicks, you know, config import and config export sidekicks. Um, yeah, so those, those two are kind of over here, but you know, you have to consider it when you're working in a multi-branch environment as well, right? If you, if you have like a, a master branch and a feature branch, and you are going to switch from master to your feature branch, if you have any outstanding work on that master branch, any outstanding config on that master branch, you kind of have to go through the pro You have to export any outstanding config on that master branch, get it into the repo, and then do a git checkout. You know, git checkout is cha could potentially change the code base. Just like a git pull could potentially change your code base, which means you could potentially have new configuration which means you have to get import. I'm sorry, Josh, config import. Get import, I guess you could try that, but probably won't work so well. So this, I, I think this was, this is kind of like step two in the mind shift, right? Step one is kind of understanding the, what's actually happening, but step two is it has to become part of your process. And it has to become part of the whole team's process because <laughs> this doesn't work if one out of your three developers is using it. It really doesn't. So Mike, yeah. The first point there, git config export, is that right? No, <laughs> it's not. It's trash. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to change that right now. Clearly, I, I make that mistake a lot, don't I? Good catch. I appreciate that. Drush. And I have to spell it right. Drush. OK. Perfect. So only Roger is paying attention. That's what this tells me, because nobody else got that. <laughs> OK, um, so let's talk a little more in details. We do a Drush config export. Where do these files go? Well, they go into this sync directory. Where's the sync directory? Well, it's defined usually in your settings.php. Um, if you I mean, how many people use the composer template, the Drupal project? Comp oh my gosh, seriously? You should all be in Hawkeye's talk right now instead of my talk then. Um, the composer template um, basically by default creates a config slash sync directory above the doc root. So I'm not going to go, I'm not going to um, go into the details of this, but it's set in the settings.php file. So that in a multi sync, does that mean all of them use the same one? Or would it be different for each site? Uh, it sh you should set it up to be different for each site. Yeah. So, I mean, each site has its, probably going to have its own settings.php. So, in multi site, I've never done it with multi site. I'm not a big multi site fan, but um, you probably want to set something up like config slash sync slash site A slash site B slash site C, something like that. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, configuration files have lots and lots of interdependencies. And if you just think about like a content type with fields, right? Anytime you create a field, you know, you're getting a configuration for the formatter that that field uses you, uh, per a formatter per display, per view mode, a, for, um, a widget per view mode. Those are individual configurations. You're getting a configuration for the instance of the field. You're getting a configuration for the um, storage of that field. You're getting a configuration for the content type. So you add a field to a content type, and boom, that's like seven configurations. And they're all interdependent. And then you build a view that pulls from that content type in that field. So now that view is dependent on that content type, is dependent on that field, which is dependent on that widget. I mean, it's just, this is not something that we want to manage as humans. This is something we just want to trust Drupal with. And because of all these interdependencies, that's why we have to um, you know, think in this all or nothing type of mindset. Um, if you just um, install Drupal, latest version of Drupal, use the standard installation, 
go through the process, don't make any changes to your site, do a configuration export, there's a, uh, about 170 configuration files, and just stock install of Drupal. You start adding modules and views and content types and fields, this number gets big pretty fast. So, um, not recommended to export import subsets of config. Um, it kind of looks like that's what the configuration system is doing. Um, you know, because if you do a git config, git config export, the changes that you see in your config uh, directory should only be the, you know, uh, directed, uh, sorry, tied to the actual configurations that you change. Um, but when you do that config import, you have to remember it flushes what's on the, the target and replaces it with what's in your config directory. So at the very least, when you're starting off with a configuration system, keep it simple. All or, all or nothing. <clears throat> all right, live demo. Woohoo! All right, so let's, um, let's see this in action a bit. So here's what I have. I have a local site. It's green bar. So, so we're all site oriented. Local site is green bar. This is where we're going to do our work, right? This is where, as a good developer, we have good practices. We're going to work down here on local. And then I have a, a remote site up on Pantheon, yellow bar up top. So theoretically, we don't want to be making any configuration changes here, right? Because we're going to follow good developer practices. So let's go ahead and um, I kind of wipe this site clean. So consider it a new site. Um, there's this configuration synchronization page. We're going to visit this a lot. Um, this is kind of like the main features page where it shows you if your feature has been overridden or not. But no, no, con no configuration changes to import. That just means there's no differences between what's in the config directory and what's in the database. Um, and it's kind of lying because right now there's actually no configuration in the file system because we haven't started using the configuration system yet. But we're about to. Okay, so here we are on my local. I use ddev, so this ddev dot is basically me just passing a drush command to the right container. But I'm gonna do a drush config export. So I'm basically gonna take the default configuration of my local site and export it to the file system. So we're gonna let that happen. Happens pretty quick. So I say, so I said. Not with Drupal 1. No, they look away. <laughs> of course, let's see. Oh yeah, it's, it's happening, All right. There we go. All right, so let's, um, I'm just gonna open up a, um, a database client real quick. Because what I'm gonna do, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of walk through this, this first time, this diagram. Let's see, did it open? No, I, this is always my challenge is finding this window. Let's see, there you are. What, did you not actually open? I think it's open somewhere, it's just not. Well, maybe not. Oh, well, all right, we're going to do it a different way then. Do the describe. You grab a PHP my admin window here. All right, so if we take a look at the database, in a Drupal 8 database, you're going to have a config table. Pretty simple table. Really, only two columns we're concerned with. That's kind of small, isn't it? There we are. The table has, you know, we're going to talk about two fields, a name field and a data field. Inside of this data field is basically just serialized PHP array containing the configuration. So the one we're going to kind of focus on here in a minute is, um, well, there's one called system.site that stores the site name and the site slogan and stuff like that. When I ran that drush config export, all that's happening, this is why I mentioned before, it's a really simple command. 
all that's happening is Drush config export basically does a for loop. You know, it loads the every row of this table, and it says for each row, create a new YAML file called automated underscore cron dot settings dot YAML. Take the contents of this field, translate it from a serialized PHP array into YAML, and stuff it into that new file, and do that for every single row. That's Drush config export. End of story. So if we come over to our file system, in our config directory, we have automated cron settings.yaml, as promised. And if we take a look at that, this one's a pretty simple one to look at, so easy to do. You know, it's just a YAML file, and whatever the settings are for the automated cron, the interval, I guess, what's that, every three hours? 3,600 times three, I think. Um, default config hash, you know, stuff like that. So for every single you know, configuration on the site. Here's the system.site one that I mentioned that we're going to play with here. You know, as of right now, our site has no slogan in configuration. It's empty. All right, so we've kind of done the, our first step of we've done our little config export. We have a bunch of YAML files. So what's our next step? Let's do a git status. Have a bunch of new files new fields there, um, new files, git add config, git commit dash m, um, exported initial config. Git status, we're clean. So basically now we've committed all of our configuration locally. Let's just go ahead and push it up, git push origin master. And that's going to make its way up to uh, the Pantheon dev site here in a minute. Not super interesting, nothing to see yet, because we haven't really changed anything. So we're just kind of initializing the system, getting those configuration files, you know, setting a baseline. So let's actually do something now. Let's come to, let's make a very simple configuration change. As promised, we're going to change the site, site slogan. So we come here to basic site settings. And we do, let's see, welcome to Drupal Camp Atlanta 2018. All right, wow, okay, there we go. So remember, when you're in the admin area, um, well-behaved modules and Drupal core, when you save configuration in the admin area, this gets saved into that config table. It might also trigger other things to happen, right? When we create a new field and hit the button, it saves the configuration of that field to the data to the config table, but it also is going to create the proper the necessary tables in the database for that field. But when we hit this button, well-behaved modules will save their configuration in that config table. Um, and actually, recently I, I I recently came across a module that does not actually save its configuration in there, and I was appalled because I'm actually using it on a on a client site. I, I kind of need it, but I'm like, oh. What the heck? All right, so we've made that change. So let's go back. So remember, we've made it locally because we're following the rules. So let's come back to this usually helpful configuration synchronization page. So number one tip I'm going to give you, might, I have a list of tips and tricks I'm going to give you at the end here. This might be the number one. On this synchronized page, ignore what's in the yellow box. It's, I, I don't know why. I think it has to do with hashes or something, but we did not change the configuration of this stuff. We didn't even look at the configuration. We didn't even glance at it. Um, so this is generally less than helpful. So I find, just ignore it. So we're going to scroll past that. But we're going to see down here that the um, synchronization page has spotted that something's changed, which it should, right? We changed something, so something should be changed. And it correctly identifying that something's changed in our system.site configuration, and we can view the differences. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of the labeling in, 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 this, uh, um, in this modal. Um, active configuration for 99% of the Drupal 8 sites out there, uh, active configuration is the configuration in the database. So when you see active, you think database. When you see staged, this is in the config directory. This is, in, this is your YAML. So in your active configuration, in your database, you know, we have our new slogan because we just did it. But 
That slogan does not exist in our YAML file yet because we haven't exported it. So this shows us the difference. So if we were to hit this import all button, which is functionally identical to the config import dresh command, if we were to hit this import all button, this would basically flush all of the configuration in the database and pull in all the configuration in the file system. So what would our slogan be if I hit that button? It'd be empty, right? So we don't want to do that because you know we've been tasked to update the slogan. So it's configuration change. So let's come over and do our drush config export. And really what this is doing is this is flushing all of those tables in our config directory and regen, not tables, files, I'm sorry, flushing all of those YAML files and rebuilding all those YAML files with what's in the database. Now, all of them are going to be identical to what was there before except for one. But that config export command, you know, rewrote all of them. All or nothing. And we have only one that ended up being changed. System site. If we do a git diff, you know, it used to have nothing. Now it has something. All right, great. So we've done our little config export. We've got some stuff here. Let's go ahead and commit and push. Git git add config, git commit dash m. So I normally, when I am making a commit um, that involves configuration, I normally preface the commit message with config. I find that helps future Mike go back and look at the git history. So you don't have to do it, but it, it, it's helped me. So um, updated site slogan, git push origin master. It's, yeah, yep, yep. As soon as you do the config export, so the question is, if I were to refresh this page after the config export, this would go away? Absolutely, because a config export is literally copying from one to the other, so they better be identical afterwards. So we'll see that they're identical. Okay, so let's see, we pushed, Pantheon will automatically pull that into the dev site, so that looks like it happened. So now if I come here and hit reload, we don't see a slogan yet. There's nothing under here. Why? Well, we talked about it. I'll just review. Because our change is here. Our change is in the file system. Our change is not in the active configuration yet. We still have to do this config import. Before we do that, though, let's go to Pantheon Dev and look at the config sy synchronization page there. Again, ignore the yellow. All right, we've got a change. It sees that there's a difference between what's in the database and what's in the file system. It's going to be a little bit different than what we saw before. Because now, in the database, we have nothing. In the file system, we have something. So now, when we, have, we hit the import button, or we do config import, this is going to end up in the active store, and then our slogan is active. So I'll just hit the button here. Let's type in. So now we're clean. And we should be clean because we literally copied one to the other, so they should be identical. And if we go here, you know, now we've got our slogan pushed up. All right, so far so good? All right, so let's get into a little bit of trouble then. So let's say we have someone who, um, and I'm going to do something common. <laughs> um, block layout, positioning a block is configuration. It's a pretty common task. You know, so let's just on the Pantheon dev site, let's just move, um, change the order of these two blocks in the sidebar. So that's a configuration change. So if we come to the config sync page, we're going to see we've got two configuration sync change, uh, two configuration changes, and all they are is weight differences, right? What went, went from minus five or went from minus six to minus five, and the other one similar. So let's just say that this was a, like a content admin who we didn't do our job and we didn't develop a process to make sure that somebody captures this change. 
Yeah, perfectly valid change made on a dev site or a production site or something. Meanwhile, down here, you know, someone else is tasked with creating a new content type. So we'll create a movie content type. Those of you who have taken a class with me know that this is my go-to content type. Save and manage fields. And we're going to add a new field. And let's just do a, what are we going to do? Let's do, a, let's do like an image for like a movie poster. And yeah, just default values are fine. And just take default everything. All right, so let's see what that does here. So again, we got a bunch of yellow. Now we have this weird situation where we have seven removed. This is a, the other part of the labeling of this page, which really kind of annoys me. Because um, we're on our local, I just added a bunch of configuration. I added a field, I added a content type. Why is it telling me seven removed? It's very, it, well not, it is counterintuitive. I'm not gonna hedge on that one, it's, it's counterintuitive. Um, The way to read this page is if I were to hit this button, these seven would be removed. That's the best way I can kind of teach and explain how to properly interpret, you know, this, this word removed, um, which kind of makes sense, right? Because these only exist in the database. So if I were to import config from the file system, these would all get flushed, and then we'd import from the file system, so we would lose these. So it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's, in effect, what's happening. So these are all new, even though they're in the removed section. So we've, let's say we spent two or three hours building out this content type. We want to get it up to the, to the, to the dev site. So let's come over to, to here. Let's do our get status. Make sure we're clean. We're clean. Do a config export. All right, so you can see, it, you know, config export identified with seven of them, I think is what it was. And it's done the export for us. We do a git status. Slow down. You can see we've got, you know, seven new files in the config system. And you can see there, like, here's the content type. Here's the storage configuration for our field. Here is the, let's see. Uh, Here's the three view modes. Well, two view modes, one form mode. Um, here's the instance of the movie field of the movie poster field. Here's the instance of the body field. All right, so git add config, git commit dash m config added movie content type, git git push origin master. All right, so let's push that up. So we've done our config export, so this should, these should be all synced on local, which they are because what's in the file system now matches what's in the database. Pantheon will automatically pull in our commits for us. So that's basically this step right here happens automatically for dev, and that's done. So now let's take a look at this configuration page on Pantheon dev. So we see seven new, I guess that makes more sense, you know? Now in our new context, if we were to hit the import all button, we would have seven new configurations. That's the way to read it. But we also have two that will be changed, which when you first see this, when you're new to the configuration system, that sort of makes sense because if you're aware that your content admin moved those blocks like oh yeah that configuration changed but this is not going in the right direction for us right because when we hit that import all button these two changes that the content admin made only exist in the database 
So in effect, what we're going to do is we're reverting that content admin's change back to its original state. So we're losing those changes. And this is a minor change, right? Imagine if someone had built a view. We'd be losing that view. So this is, the, this is like the big danger, right, in the configuration system is accidentally overriding somebody else's configuration. And it's very easy to do. Um, unless you have a process in place. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's lose that change. But we lose that change, and this is a bug. These, this is a known bug. These teasers, they think that they're still different, but they're not, and it goes away. I don't know if it's after a crown run. I'm, I don't know when it goes away, but it's not an issue. Um, but if we look here, we now have a movie content type. You know, so we brought that configuration in, and when we did the import, you know, the import created the necessary tables for the fields and the content type and all that stuff. So all that stuff uh, works, works well. Um, so let's talk about process a little bit. How do we, you know, how do we avoid what just happened? How do we avoid, you know, plowing over someone else's configuration? Um, and there's really two ways. And there's one way I really recommend if you're new to the configuration system. So first of all, and I, I've said this word probably 15 times already, you have to have a process in place. Anyone who's you know, an admin who can make a configuration change, there needs to be a process so that if they make a configuration change, that change needs to be exported and put in the repo ASAP. If the person making the change doesn't have the, the right skill set, then they need to open up a ticket and say, hey, I've made a configuration change. Can someone please export it and get it into the file system? There has to be a, a human process to do that. Um, well, it doesn't actually even have to be a human process. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the way I recommend, and I, and I sorry, I just pounded on that. Oops, so you're going to hear some pops in the recording. Um, what I recommend with clients who are new to the configuration system is a little module called config read only. Config read only is like the Thor's hammer or Stormbreaker, if you're really into Marvel movies, of the config system. Right? Config read only, basically, you can enable it and you can say, okay, well, on the remote dev test and live sites, you're not allowed to change the configuration. I mean, and it's, I don't have it enabled, but. I'll just give you, you can, we'll do a little thought process, thought experiment. <laughs> when you have it enabled, there's a message on the top of every configuration page that basically says, configuration in this environment is locked. And this button is no longer blue. It is gray and it's not clickable. You cannot change configuration, you know, in the environment if this module is enabled. There's a little asterisk there because you can whitelist configurations if you want, but I'm not going to get into that. So um, it's a really good module. It's training wheels for the configuration system. That's the way I describe it to my clients. And it's a money saver and it's a time saver. <laughs> you know, when the team is learning the configuration system, you got to, you know, it's like when you take your kids bowling and the little rails come up on the side, that's what this is for the configuration system. It's a really good tool. Um, that's the way I describe to clients, but then I never take it away. It stays up there forever. Because just, it just enforces the process. And it enforces good developer workflow. Um, all right, so let me wrap things up here. All right, tips and tricks. Yeah, when possible. Use configuration read-only in at least the live environment. At least. I like to push my clients and, you know, I'm pretty anal retentive though, but I'm like, anything remote. You know, you look, no touch. Look, no change. Um, yeah, it's like training wheels. Okay. Um, this is the process, right? When changes are made, especially in a remote, remote environment, have a process to get those things captured somehow. There's a module called, um, I'm not a fan of this module, but other people are, so I won't mention it, Config Suite. Config Suite is Thor's hammer, but in the other direction. Config Suite will, whenever you make a configuration change, it will do an export. So 
it's basically like having your active configuration in both the database and the file system. So whenever you do, you know, whenever you change that slogan and hit that button, boom, config export. And you can also configure it that whenever that module sees a change in your config files, do an import. So it like automates it. Um, before working in your local, this is the going back to you do your git pull. It's got a new sidekick. Do your config import. When you're changing branches, before you change branches, make sure you don't have to export. After you change branches, do a config import. Um, this is just the one of, I think it's a good idea, inc you know, include the word config in your commit messages. I preface my commit messages with the word config if there's configuration involved. Saves me time later on. And ignore the yellow text on the config synchronization page <laughs> until that is, is fixed. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's my 48 minutes. Any questions? How would this work with features module? If you want to well, feature in your workflow. Features module, you know, it should, in, in, in your mindset, go back to what features module was originally developed to do, to share configuration between sites. So theoretically, they, they, they work fine together, right? The features module is exporting a subset of the configuration to some other location, you know, a download. So as long as you're using each of them for their intended purpose, should be fine. It's when you start, it's when the Venn diagrams start intersecting that you could have problems. No other questions? Because my presentation was so awesome, I answered them all already. Let's go with that. All right. Yeah. Uh, on features, at least in these sets of new rights, when you create a new content type, package it up, push it up, enable it, release that content type, if you take that out of the feature, then do not delete it. It doesn't get rid of content types and features, but this does. This does. Correct. Correct. Yeah. The flushing is the part that. You know, that import, I mean, when, like even when you do the git diff, you see, oh, well, it's just a system.site. That's a minor one. But behind the scenes, the import command is still flushing all of the existing stuff and then re-importing all of it. And that flushing is where you lose anything that's been changed in that environment but not exported. All right. Thank you very much. I'll be around if anybody has any questions.